How many of you folks were here on Good Friday? Oh, I tell you, we had a heaven of a service that day, boy. Sorry, bad joke. It was a great day in the house of the Lord on Good Friday. We had a wonderful time together in His presence. But I tell you, that was good, but today it's going to be better. It's already good. So the Lord has good plans for us this morning as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. This is a banner day for the church. This is the day that we can stand upon the, the reality that Jesus Christ is risen. That he's alive. You know, the cross proved one thing, that Jesus was the Savior, the sacrificial lamb, who gave his life at, at Calvary to save a wretch like me. He sang that on Friday. But today, the thing that happened during the resurrection moment is that Jesus proved himself to be God, to be the Lord of all. Because of the resurrection power of God, this is, this is the most amazing, special, awesome news for the church. J this just in, Jesus is alive, you know? CNN should be reporting on this. All the newspapers of the world should have a headline saying, guess what, Jesus is risen. Because this is not just 2,000 year old news, this is news today, as of this morning, that we celebrate the fact that Jesus is alive. So that's why you're here this morning, I believe with all my heart, that you're here to talk about, and hurt hear about, and celebrate the resurrection of Christ. What the resurrection means for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, an amazing discourse, of, and, and the Apostle Paul is writing to us about what happened during this amazing story. First of all, let's go to Luke 24, because we've got to know what happened on Sunday morning. Good Friday, we left the service celebrating the cross, but there's the rest of the story today, right? It says, in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, and the men said to them, the angels who were there at the tomb said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. Don't you remember? Isn't it funny how we forget things so quickly? You know, if I was going to put a list of things to do, I think if I was with Jesus traveling around and I got up my Blackberry, I think if Jesus said, guess what? I probably will be raised from the dead in three days. I think I would probably write that down. I think I would probably think, well, that's pretty extraordinary that a man standing before me, even though he's wonderful and he heals people and he raised Lazarus from the dead and he, he's just an amazing man and a man of God and a profound man, but he just told me that he is going to be risen from the dead in less than three days after his death. I think I would write that down. So here it is, the angels are saying, guess what? Human beings who forget things and don't even know what you had for supper last night. Or forget whether you locked the house before you go on holidays and you gotta turn around and go back to check the door again, huh? Yeah? How many have never had to do that? Okay, you're type A people. Did you check the three times before you actually left? That's right. The angel said, all of you human beings who forget things, remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. Jesus shared this whole story before it happened. He shared the whole discourse of what would happen next with the disciples. And the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians then afterwards, he reminds us about the whole thing and tells us the story of what happened next. This is really cool. He says in verse 1, he says, now brothers, I want to remind you. Isn't it funny how we need reminders? Every year we need to do this, so we're refreshed again on the most amazing story about how Christ is risen. I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand of faith. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. This is important for us to see that we hold firm to this doctrine of the resurrection of Christ because this is one of the most profound points of history. This divided the calendar from B.C. to A.D. This was one of the most defining watershed moments in all of history. And he says this, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. This is 
priority number one for the church to believe that Jesus is raised from the dead. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures it says. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scripture. The Old Testament account of the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. And it says after, after that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers. Wow. Five hundred people. At the same time. Most of whom are still are, are still living, of course, written in the, the contemporary time. Though stuff, some have already fallen asleep. Then it says that he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. And he goes on with his testimony and says, For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me, whether then it was I or they. This is what we preach. And this is what you believe. Paul is saying this, despite my history, despite my reputation, despite the stuff that I've done, that you, the baggage that you carry against me for persecuting the church, it doesn't really matter what man has done or believed or, or, or said. What matters is that you believe that Jesus is risen. That you believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that Christ the Lord is risen today. Ah, hallelujah. And then when you sing that song, you're like, oh, it's about time we sang that because he's risen. He's alive. Because this is so important for us. Now, I'm not taking away the moment of the cross in comparison to the resurrection because the cross is absolutely necessary for the believer to understand the empty tomb. The reason why Jesus went to the cross was, of course, to pay the price for the sins of man. And, and, and as the sacrificial lamb of God, he was placed in a place between God and man as that sacrificial in-between, go-between, where he gave his life on our behalf to satisfy the wrath and the law of God. We have to understand that if Christ gave his life because he's God, it can't be the end of the story. There has to be a resurrection moment because he's eternal. He's God. Amen? And on the third day, he predicted that he would be raised from the dead. I love what uh, some of the historical uh, discourse or preachers have said about this, like Charles Spurgeon, who obviously we, we know as an amazing speaker and preacher, man of God. He said this. He says, we will by faith put ourselves at the foot of the little knoll of Calvary. This is the journey that we are supposed to be on as believers. There we see in the center between two thieves, the Son of God made flesh, nailed by his hands and feet and dying in an anguish that words cannot portray. Look steadfastly and devoutly, gazing through your tears. I will ask you first to smite your chest as you remember that you see in him your own sins. Then see the greatness of your sins that require so vast a sacrifice. You know, I know in our culture today in 2012, the word sin has been minimalized. But to God, sin is a chasm of separation between God and man. The only one who is big enough, strong enough, and eternal enough to bridge the chasm of sin between God and man is an eternal Son of God, Lamb of God, named Jesus Christ. You can't do good enough. You can't give enough. You can't be good enough. You can't perform well enough to satisfy the distance of the chasm between man and God because of the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. And sin is not with a small S in the eyes of God. It's with a capital S, no matter what the sin is. And only Jesus could take that moment of sacrifice, the greatness of our sins, requiring such a vast and profound sacrifice. But thank God that the story didn't end at the cross. And I know that today in the church, there are people who criticize our theology, criticize our methods, and criticize who we are and how we live and they say that churches are full of hypocrites and they say religion causes wars and atrocities and, 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 and they say if that's what Christianity is all about 
I want no part of it. But that is not what Christianity is all about. These are all distractions that the enemy tries to bring to bear on the church to take us away from the central focus that Jesus Christ is Lord and is risen from the dead. And when we get the central focus of the, the grace and the love and the mercy of God, we don't care so much about the performance of people like Paul said. We don't care so much about how well people do or don't do. We don't get all caught up with stumbling blocks. We celebrate the resurrection power of Christ and we live in the freedom of that resurrection power. And that's where the church is called to be, ladies and gentlemen. Beyond looking at the performance of people in comparative, we look at the performance of a God who gave his life, who humbled himself, and gave it at Calvary to save a wretch like me. Because I am a wretch. So are you. But thank God I'm free from the penalty of my wretchedness through the blood of the Lamb who loves me. I'm free. A wretch is free. What a contrast. What an amazing story. What an awesome testimony. And I love Christian philosopher uh, Rabbi Zacharias said this. He said, it seems so simplistic, doesn't it? A group of gullible, pre-scientific, he's talking about the apostles, pre-scientific men succumbing to the illusions and the deceptions of their day, yet every piece of evidence mustered, including the prophecies, and all things that were brought together and the inexplainable change in the courage and, and the lifestyle of these apostles shows empirical evidence again, again, powerfully for the truth of the resurrection of Christ. It, when we begin to really focus on the power of God, all the other stuff doesn't matter anymore. It really doesn't. And it's interesting because through history there have been people, even skeptics, who have tried to discredit the resurrection of Christ. I love this because Dr. Simon Greenleaf, here's a good example, um, the Royal Professor of Law at Harvard University. Dr. Greenleaf is considered one of the world's top authorities on legal evidences. And after applying his expertise to the resurrection story, he concluded that it was, in fact, an actual historical reality. His research is available in a book called The Testimony of the Evangelists. Or here's another one, British lawyer Frank Morrison. Here's another great story who set out to write a book repudiating the uh, resurrection and instead found so much evidence so overwhelming that he actually became a believer himself. And his findings can be read in the book Who Moved the Stone? Or the big one that we all know about, Chicago Tribune journalist Lee Strobel, who again set out to try and discredit the skeptic attempting to discredit Christian faith in general and Christ in general but wound up having his own life-changing encounter with the risen Christ himself, where he wrote the popular book, The Case for Christ, The Case for the Creator, The Case for Christmas. He goes on and on to bring fact about the resurrection. Here, here, are the, here are the big arguments against the resurrection in our culture. This is interesting because they really have no biblical foundation. They're all about people and their feelings. Number one, they say Jesus didn't actually die. Well, okay. I have a problem with that one, don't you? Well, number two, they say the disciples stole the body from the tomb and created this great grand hoax that 500 people all agreed on. Now, have you ever met three people who agreed on something? <laughs> like, you have a family with kids? Now, Seth. 500 people all got together in a room and went, Shh, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to make a whole religion. And nobody's allowed to tell. Because if you do, you know, we don't come to get you. Or whoever. It doesn't happen that way, ladies and gentlemen. That's not how society works. Or number three, the records conflict and cannot be trusted. They're talking about the biblical records in the, in the New Testament in all of the Gospels. Well, let me tell you something this morning. That, first of all, Jesus' death was confirmed because a Roman spear produced blood and water in the moment of his death. And that means that his pericardium, his heart, was completely severed. And I don't know how you feel, but if there's a spear in my heart, I won't survive especially with no medical intervention. The second thing is, you've got to look at the disciples.
disciples, with the second reason that the disciples had this great plan and somehow created this hope, the disciples were willing after this point to suffer and die for Jesus. Why would they go to this extreme if they were staging a resurrection hoax? Why was the account not more convincing prior to the cross if they were planning all this in advance? They were clueless about what was going to happen next before the cross. They were sitting in the upper room arguing over who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven beside Jesus. They didn't understand exactly what was going to happen next, even though Jesus told them the whole plan. How could they then get together and come up with the great hopes? It makes absolutely no historical sociological sense. It doesn't. Even the gospel and this confusion of the gospel supports different aspects of the timeline of Christ of the resurrection account, but they do not conflict. It's interesting if you take the Schofield Bible and you begin to study through the timeline of the resurrection of Christ, it all fits together perfectly that Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, three women, start for the tomb, followed by other women bearing spices. The three find the stone rolled away, and Mary Magdalene goes to runs to tell the disciples. And Mary, the mother of James, draws near to the tomb, sees, sees the angel of the Lord. She goes back to meet the other women coming with the spices. Peter and John are now warned by Mary Magdalene, arrive, they run in and look in, and then they go away. And Mary Magdalene returns weeping, sees two angels, then she sees Jesus. It all fits together perfectly in the timeline. And then he says, go tell the disciples. And then Mary, the mother of James, James and Joseph, meanwhile, has met the women with the spices, returns with them, and they also see the two angels. It works perfectly together for good. That all of those people had a chance to be told he's risen, including the disciples. This is exciting. This, and, and, and how on earth could... Anybody move a stone without any large equipment? Seriously, right? There's so many things that the world has tried to impose upon the resurrection story, but it doesn't make any sense at all. So here are other proofs to satisfy the argument. The immediate impact of the religious world of the day. Did you know that suddenly there was a change in the day of worship? Suddenly they went from the Sabbath to Sunday. They began to worship on Sunday. Why would that happen? Suddenly there's a practice of communion in the church, according to early writers. Suddenly there are all these art forms depicting the resurrection power of Christ, Christ being risen, and the ascension of Christ in artwork, suddenly found in the catacombs under Rome and under all of these archives of ancient history in archaeological finds that suddenly the entire world went boom in the art world about the resurrection of a God who came to earth and gave his life for our sins. There's so much archaeological, empirical evidence that Christ was risen both historically, physically, and spiritually. It's all there, ladies and gentlemen. It, there is more evidence to the resurrection of Christ than there is even to what you had for supper last night. It's an amazing thing when you begin to study it. The 500 eyewitness account. Many were tortured and killed to, to, to deny their account, and they, they gave their lives for the account. Now, if you were going to keep a secret that was really important to 500 people, would you be the first one to give your life for it if it, didn't, if it wasn't really true? I don't think so. Or the dramatic, dramatic conversion of two previous skeptics, James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul, Saul of Tarsus, who gave their lives to Christ and were willing to go to the end for free. Folks, I know this is a summary, because there's a lot more that we're going to start talking about on Wednesday night to dig deeper into this. But I just want you to know that what you believe is absolutely true. That he is risen. The fulfillment of prophecy is profound in, in the scripture. It's amazing that all of the things that were foretold about Christ, like Psalm 1610, it says, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your holy one see decay. Peter in the, in the Pentecost sermon says, and he quotes this from Psalm 16.10, he says that Jesus' resurrection was a fulfillment of Psalm 16.10, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your holy one see decay. Paul in Antioch in Acts 13 even says, we tell you the good news, what God promised our fathers, he has fulfilled in for us their children by raising up Jesus from the dead, as it is written in the Psalms, you are my son, today I have become your father. 
The fact that God raised him from the dead, never to decay, is stated in all the words of Peter's sermon and discourse going into the New Testament. Isaiah 53, 10 says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord, and through the Lord, makes his, his, his life a guilt offering, he will set the offspring to prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his sand. So he talks about crushing the Savior. And jo Jonah, but the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Now how many of you know that that is foreshadowing for Christ? That that is a, a, a type of Christ coming soon to remind everybody that God is setting the pace for the resurrection. You know, the Old Testament, ladies and gentlemen, is full of allusions to the moments of Jesus' life. The promise <coughs> The setting up for us to believe. The whole Old Testament, if you read it and you interpret it right with the typology, with the foreshadowing of Christ, all of the, the feasts, all of the festivals, everything that the Jewish nation did was pointing to the moment of Jesus' birth, Jesus' life, Jesus' death, and his resurrection and his ascension. It's all there. It's all foreshadowed in the, in the scripture. And Jesus even predicted his death himself. In Matthew, Matthew, Mark, John, and 16 more times in the New Testament, Jesus talks about John chapter 10. He says, I lay down my life that I may take it again. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down by myself. I have the power to lay it down, but I have the power to take it up again. He told them. It's interesting that even in the scripture, the story of the resurrection continues and it's never changed. It never changes that the tomb was empty. That he appeared 11 times visibly to other people. He appeared to Mary Magdalene, to the other women, to Peter, to Cleopas, to the um, leader of Emmaus, in the closed room to the 10 disciples, to the 11, to the, in the mountains to the 11, at the seat of Peter, Thomas, Thomas, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples, to 500 brethren at once, to James and all the apostles, to Paul. He kept on showing up. Every time they turned the corner, there was Jesus in his resurrected form. For a long time, he didn't just come and go. It was like 50-some days that he was hanging around in his resurrection form. How could people not believe that he was raised from the dead? I don't understand how the world can go, no, no, that can't happen, because I just can't believe it. But when you have a God who has all power and controls the universe, anything's possible. Anything's possible. He talked with those disciples. He ate with those people. He touched them. There was interaction. There was care. There was love. There was teaching. There was restoration. <laughs> Jesus had to finish his race on earth to settle his relationships so that he could ascend from the right hand of the Father and make intercession for us. It's an amazing story. So, Jesus said to the Pharisees, destroy this temple. <laughs> And I promise you, go ahead and just pray. But I promise you I will raise it again in three days. Now, of course, the religious leaders of the day didn't understand because they replied, hold on a minute, Jesus. It took 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But it said in verse 21 in John, but the temple he was had spoken of was not the physical building. It was his body. It was the temple of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the Holy One of Israel, the Lamb of God from the foundation of the earth who was slain in the eyes and hearts eternally of God before he even arrived. He didn't intend on knocking any temples down because that was Old Testament. That was Jericho. That was proving the power and the provision of God. But there's a greater victory in the resurrection of the body over rebuilding a temple. Nobody can rebuild a body. Amen? Amen. We could rebuild the temple in another 46 years. Nothing, and, and, and 2,000 years later, no big deal. But to resurrect a body, who can forget that? Who can forget when God has resurrected? Now, I got the probably say, hold on a minute, there were other, others raised in the Bible who were raised from the dead before Jesus, right? That's true. There were other people who were what we call resuscitated in the Bible. There was Elijah who raised the son of, uh, of the Zarephath widow from the dead in 1 Kings 17. There was Elisha 
who raised the son of the Shunammite woman from the dead in 2 Kings 4. There was a man who was raised from the dead when he touched Elisha's bones in 2 Kings 13. There were many saints who rose from the dead at the death moment of Jesus, and the graves shook and they came to life. Fifty-two of the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which were sleeping arose, it says. Jesus raised the son of the widow of Nain from the dead. And, and he came, it says, he came, he touched her, he touched the beer, and, they, and, and, and they, they, they said, young man, I say unto thee, arise, and he that was dead sat up and began to speak. Jesus raised the daughter of Jairus in Luke chapter 8. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in John 11. We see all of this. Peter raised Dorcas from the dead in Acts chapter 9, and Eutychus was raised from the dead by Paul after he fell asleep when he was preaching. I wish I had a little resurrection power once in a while. So, all of these accounts of people who were raised from the dead, they were resuscitated. But guess what? They all died again. What's the difference here? The difference is this, that Jesus is what we call the first fruits of a permanent resurrection to eternal life in order to return back to the Father. This is why he said, I am the resurrection and the life. I don't do resurrection. It's not part of my portfolio. It's not something I accomplish or do. It's not, one, it's not on my resume to do resurrection, even though I have done that. He says, actually, my personhood, through me, I am resurrection. That when you're in Christ, you are in that resurrection power. <coughs> That you'll live forever when you know Jesus. You will live forever if you know Jesus. Ever. You know what he said to, to, to the, the women when Lazarus died? He says that the one who believes in me will live. Even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me, he said, will never die. Physically, death is a journey towards an eternal life. But the second death, the bigger death, the eternal separation death, the separation from God moment, ladies and gentlemen, that will never happen to the believer. Can you thank God for that? Can you thank God for that? All I know is this, that when we were here on, on Good Friday, there were a few folks who... Uh, came in and interrupted the sermon, you know. And I just, I, I, I heard their hearts because when the moment of Jesus' death came, there were big questions about why he did what he did and who he was. Well, in the midst of their disappointment, I wonder now how our friends reacted on Easter morning. Themselves. Let us go. 
we should go. If this is true, this could be a cause for great celebration. It is true, fine sir, it is true. He, he died, he rose again. It is the greatest day in history. Let's go celebrate. Yeah.